My name is Ken McIntosh. I'm the presiding officer here at the Scottish Parliament, and uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the Festival of Politics 2019. Uh, and thank you very much for coming along. I hope you're um, sharpened up your questions. I can see some of you taking notes already. That's good to see. Um, this is our, our 15th Festival of Politics, and it's a chance. We, we, we founded this Parliament on the principles of openness and accessibility and transparency. But the festival... Um, takes that even further, it opens up uh, the building and the committee rooms and the chamber to you. This is your parliament that allows you to put questions to politicians or in this case to journalists. So we've turned the tables on our, our colleagues yes, the third estate here. It's the 20th year of the parliament. We've been, had a chance to reflect back uh, over the last 20 years and how far we've come. And today we really want to look at 20 years of reporting on the parliament. So I'm joined by a very, very distinguished panel, uh, people who are very familiar to, I think, to you and certainly to all of us who work here in Parliament. So uh, in, in starting at the far end, Brian Taylor is the BBC's political editor. Uh, I think started first as a, a journalism in print for five years, but joined the BBC in 1985. So I had to mention that, Brian. Yes, I know. Although I think our, our audience think you're just a boy. Uh, I know, eh? so do I. So, uh, and Brian offers um, uh, lots of commentary. You'll know him from his, his uh, daily appearances on the news, but also writes a daily column on the BBC website and is also uh, an honorary professor in the School of Social and Political Sciences at the University of Glasgow and also an author of two books and a contributor to many more. Katrine Busey is very familiar to us, but perhaps less to yourselves as an audience because she is the political editor of the Press Association, which is the, uh, the UK's main uh, online uh, news, uh, news agency. Uh, and Katrine has worked in Scottish politics and covered the Parliament since 2005 uh, and been political editor here at Holyrood uh, since 2010. And a political career spanning 25 years, she's covered eight major election campaigns and both the Scottish independence and the European referendums. Colin Mackay, uh, has reported on the Scottish Parliament from the very beginning. Now, I believe Colin actually covered the 1990 elections. The, 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 the Scottish Parliament, not the pre-1707 one, no. That was just, <laughs> it was just Brian that was covering that one. <laughs> it started already. Uh, so uh, I think Colin covered the 1990 elections for BBC Radio Scotland and immediately left that week, and within a week, took up a new post with what was then called Scottish Radio Holdings. So he became the voice of, uh, uh, for, from Hollywood for Radio Forth, Radio Clyde, Radio T, North Sound, West Sound, Murray, Murray and uh, Murray Firth Radio. But in 2015, he decided he had too good a face for radio, and he moved to STV and has become their political editor. And Elizabeth Quigley is a news correspondent for BBC Scotland, presented many uh, radio and television documentaries, including the acclaimed documentary on multiple sclerosis titled Scotland's Hidden Epidemic, The Truth About MS. But before joining the BBC, Elizabeth worked for The Scotsman, Scotland on Sunday, and in 1999 was one of a few women journalists, and we might come back to that point, Elizabeth, uh, as the correspondent for the Scottish Daily Mail. So one of the first to, re to report in this parliament. So our panel, can I give you a war, uh, ask you to join me and give them a warm welcome because it might change after that. So we'll give yeah. them a round of applause at the beginning. <laughs> and this is very much participative. So if you've got any questions or comments you wish to make, um, just catch my eye and I, I will try and take you in and we'll throw them. But I'm going to start off first. And I'll just, I'll start with you, Brian, uh, if I may. Uh, you, you have reported on hundreds, if not thousands, of stories from uh, Hollywood. Um, is there any particular one that sticks in your mind that, that because it's particularly significant, particularly difficult, mm. or particularly enjoyable yeah, for I you mean, to the, the, the best story I've done is, was, was the one last night. It's always the way with journalists. You know, that's great what you've got for the morning. But if I can be uh, a, a little more uh, reflective than that, the, the one I perhaps enjoyed most was one you might not remember, was when Willie Rennie was being interviewed at the launch of his manifesto, and there was a couple of amorous pigs in the background <laughs> behind him. I, I, I had real fun scripting that, and Willie took it extremely well and arrived at the news conference the next day with a bag full of Peppa the Pig sweeties to hand out to, to the media. It was, it was the only way he could handle that, that, that was great fun. But I, I think, I mean, there's been some incredible stories, the, the, the referendum in 2014, of course, 
and in 16, the, the various elections. But perhaps going back, because we're talking about 20 years, going back to the foundation of the, the, the devolved parliament, it really was quite a remarkable day. That, that July the 1st, 1999, um, Donald Dewar's speech, Sheena Wellington singing A Man's A Man, and everybody joining in gustily with the royal family sitting looking slightly puzzled in the middle of this, this, uh, this demotic demand for, for common humanity. I thought that was, uh, that was most entertaining. Um, and uh, the, the, the speeches surrounding that and the establishment of the parliament and the, the excitement afterwards, you know, the parade down the mound with all the, the floats and the music and all of that. I swear I saw Donald's shoulder, his left shoulder twitched a, a quarter of a centimeter, which for Donald was the height of ecstasy. So I think that was probably quite good. But I also recall the establishment of the parliament, the, the coalition discussions were, were amazing. Again, it's a story involving involving Dewar. The coalition discussions were going on between Labour and the Liberal Democrats, and they, they proceeded eventually in the way that I guess they're doing right now with Brexit, putting down the things they agreed and then the areas they disagreed with. And the areas they disagreed with had three lines down the side. And Dewar picked up one of, one of policy, and he said, well, it's just absolute damn nonsense. We're not having this. And the then uh, permanent secretary, who was assisting with the talk, said, uh, Mr. Dewar, that was actually in the Labour manifesto. You know? <laughs> he says, well, it's bloody nonsense anyway. We're not having it. That's out. So, uh, but so uh, that, that sort of uh, uh, in, in insight can, can be fun as well. But it's been a tremendous um, privilege and, and, and joy to cover Scottish politics. I've covered it since Braveheart was a boy. But, it, but it's been, been, been great in the last 20 years. Um, I should wear the badge because I covered the Constitutional Convention, the cross-party Constitution. Remember that? Cross-party Convention. I covered it for the entirety of its duration, and I, I reckon I should wear a badge saying that I, I, I endured and suffered that. But it's been a great joy, a great pride. Thanks, thanks very much, uh, Brian. And uh, Katrina, I'm just going to ask you, um, we all know, I was just hinting earlier, as, as um, politicians, we're very aware of the coverage that Press Association give the Parliament. Uh, but perhaps... Um, you can also just uh, let our, our, our guests here know as well, because you cover everything. You cover, and, and not only that, you don't editorialise. You have to cover all the proceedings here in a, in a very straight way. Yeah, no. The, the Press Association is known for providing impartial coverage. Um, what we do is we cover the committee meetings here, the chamber here, and um, I've got a team of colleagues who do similar work down at Westminster, but it's really about providing perhaps not the facts, because facts are, are quite a loose term sometimes in politics, but it's providing quite a, a straightforward narrative of, of what happened without the, the editorialising and the spin um, that you get in, in some newspapers. Um, we do that, we send a copy out to all our customers who include all the major newspapers, broadcasters, the main news websites, uh, the radio and TV stations, but also major businesses will subscribe to The Wire. So our copy really does go all over the world. Um, and at PA, which was founded just over 150 years ago by the, the newspapers themselves at the time as, as being a way of, of getting breaking news out quickly, um, but also a way of getting a trusted source of news out quickly. And that's very much what we, we still subscribe uh, to do. But I was, I was just thinking, Brian was talking there about covering the, the Constitutional Convention, not to have a pop at Brian. Uh, I studied all that when I was at university, you, you so... Can, you, you can go off, folk, you know, you really can. Can I ask you the... the, the uh, Brian's talked, I'm not... Uh, singling out as, as the, the, some of the more glamorous events or the more high profile events but but you're covering um you're covering you know working committees and 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 many events that that are very important for me put it that way but perhaps not going to be the most grabby yeah but i think there there are still absolutely stories in them when you see things like the petitions committee which when this parliament set up the petitions committee was really groundbreaking nobody certainly in the uk had done anything like that and you, you still do, you get people coming to the committee and telling their story and, and making their plea. And there have been some fantastically moving cases, people who've come and, and told how they've been denied cancer drugs because they've been too expensive and, and come and, and sat before MSPs. Um, people who've come and talked about, about mental health provisions, um, the lack of support for them. There have been fantastically moving stories, and you still get that when you go away from the kind of the 
the big events, the, the independence referendum, and things like that show how, how politics can still be personal and that it is about making a difference to the, the lives of people. Um, the, the couple I remember who came to the petitions committee because the, the chap, I think Michael Gray might have been the name, um, because he couldn't get a, a cancer drug. That sparked a whole review of the way that um, the Scottish Medicines uh, Consortium works. Um, and that's led to changes in the way that have led to, to more drugs being available. It's a process that's taken years, but that shows how not only that this parliament can make a difference, but that one individual can really make a difference. And I think that's one of the most powerful things. And, and also the role of the media in covering it, because we can discuss these things, but if it's not then shared with the public, uh, and I'm conscious that the, the mesh implant case, which dominated mm -hmm. First Minister's question this week, mm -hmm. began as a, a petitions case. Mm -hmm. uh, Elizabeth, can I just turn to you, that where, where the Press Association um, doesn't editorialise, your first cover, you're working for the Scottish Daily Mail. Uh, what, what was that like covering the, the 19... I can't even remember, was the Daily Mail pro-devolution um, at that stage or uh, equivocal or...? Uh, I think it was, um, yeah, it knew it was going to happen and so yeah. was coming to terms with it, probably. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I had, you were saying there, I mean, I, I worked for the Scotsman, Scotland Sunday, before moving to the, uh, the Scottish Daily Mail. Um, and I was just um, fascinated by politics and I was determined to report on the very first parliament. So I had done all my kind of apprenticeship in these other newspapers through the 97 election, through the machinations about whether Labour was gonna have one referendum, two referendums, one referendum again, I think, and then, yeah, getting through all that. So my prime purpose was, I want to be reporting this parliament. So that was my objective. I was working for the Daily Mail as the features editor. And I said to my editor, yeah, this is great. I love working as a features editor. I've got a great budget. I spend money. I employ people, but I want to be a political correspondent. And he looked at me and said, you must be mad. I, no, no, there's a massive story about to happen. I want to be there. I want to report on this parliament. And that's what he eventually conceded and I moved to do that. Um, and therefore, I got my ambition to be part of the class of 99. I was, and that was a great privilege to be part of this group. Can I ask you, because Scotland, well, the, the nature of politics has changed because of the Parliament in many ways. Has the nature of, of political journalism in Scotland or the nature of the way the media work in Scotland changed because of the Parliament as well? Well, it's certainly when the Parliament was designed to be closer to the people mm. and so therefore by extension um, the press would have to get more involved in stories that were closer to the people. So I think the people have been brought along um, by the press, by stories, by the fact that we're right in here. We're yeah. very much right in here and we can get into the politicians we often and talk, what's happening. We, we often talk about how, the, uh, I still don't know when it happened exactly over 20 years, how they, uh, and uh, clearly with Brexit, the focus is still very much on, on, on Westminster at the moment because of Brexit, but there was a sort of shift in the centre of political gravity in the way that the newspapers, I think in particular, well, all the media covered politics in Scotland. And it was partly to do with the fact that there's so many political journalists based here in, in Holyrood. Was that something that you were aware of yourself again? Well, or? certainly a change in the number of people in, involved. I mean, there were, I had worked for a few days at Westminster on and off, um, and the other journalists that were part of that first uh, press team, I suppose, had all been involved in reporting politics in Scotland. But often it was, um, elections, by-elections, or, you know, the Scottish Grand Committee coming up to, you know, uh, touring Scotland. So we were involved then. What I thought was very interesting was that the first parliament um, in 99 was in the General Assembly Hall mm -hmm. at the top of the mound, which was, I think, lovely, because 
that was a place where the, uh, the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland met. And when we didn't have a parliament, often it was said that that was the parliament in waiting. And a lot of the journalists who eventually became the political journalists uh, working in the parliament at that time, often while the General Assembly was on, weren't actually working, reporting on the General Assembly because the debates on um, the wars at the time, there were, you know, every political topic of the day was debated up there in the General Assembly Hall. And then the Parliament mm -hmm. arrived in the temporary home and similar debates were happening with similar journalists who were involved and interested in the politics of the day. Uh -huh. I wonder if the language was better when the church was debating it or the parliament. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> and Colin, can I ask you, um, we've talked about some of the, already some of the, 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 the highlights, the main events in the parliament's development, but there have been a, a lot of stories, not all of them positive, of course. Which, which ones are, I mean, do you, do you, do you th look back and remember the good stories or do you remember the sort of the scandals and the... Uh, no, I was the looking back, you've forgotten most of them. Um, <laughs> no, you remember them all because... As Brian said, it's been an incredible privilege to be able to, to, to cover them all, and they've been fascinating. And, and the thing is, good or bad, it's the development of politics, it's the development of a nation that we've seen over the last 20 years. I mean, you were talk, talking to, to Liz just now about um, how, how, well, you know, when things changed. I mean, Hollywood is now the focus of Scottish politics in a way that I don't think any of us could have remotely predicted 20 years ago. You know, because 20 years ago, in the early days of the Parliament, there were a lot of negative stories about your medals and all sorts of things. I mean, have you still got yours? Of course I've got some Excellent. Uh, you know, you know, they, they, sorry, they were, they were getting a terrible time for things like this. And Before they, we even started. They amounted to nothing, you know. It was just a week and a plaque to commemorate the start of the Parliament. But, you know, for some of the tabloids, it was an absolute disgrace that you were awarding yourself medals as if you were going to pin them to the, 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 <laughs> the pocket of your jacket or something I, like I've that. I've tried sell tipping mine here. Yeah, it would weigh there. you down a fair yes, bit. Yeah. But, you know, it was just, th there, were, there were terrible stories like that all the time. Because, and, and part of that was because it was all new. Um, I mean, you know, one of the things that always springs to mind about the early days of the Parliament is the, the Alistair Gray quote that's now on the outside of the building, work as if you're in the early days of a better nation. And I think that was something that, I think a lot of politicians took that to heart. I actually think that quite a lot of journalists took that to heart as well and, and, and were entirely committed to the whole concept of having a Scottish Parliament and reporting it fairly and I think you know that's what a lot of folk have tried to do ever since now you can argue that it's not always been fair and, and I would probably support you on some of that but um, an awful lot of it was brought on by the naivety not just of the politicians but also probably of the journalists also you got to remember there were an awful lot more journalists in those days you know the daily record was the big tabloid newspaper it had a team of six or seven in the old parliament building mm -hmm. and now it's got two and they all smoked <laughs> yeah well that was, that was the other thing there was the, there was the bad boys room upstairs in the old press room which was where everybody went for a fag um and they would quite often hang out the windows to try and have a fag after it was banned but then to be fair i remember george reed when he was deputy presiding oh, officer sh doing that as well <laughs> he would I'm not, I'm not going to shoot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he would hang out his office over the... the cow, was it, it wasn't quite the cow, it, was, it wasn't the lawn market, it was the back one. Um, right around right the back. Uh, um, he, his office overhung off. there. And, uh, and he would hang out the office so he wouldn't set a smoke alarm off. Hmm. Um, my, my lovely predecessor got caught um, having a fag in his office um, by health and safety. And not so much the problem that he was having a cigarette, but he was lighting it on the old electric bar fire <laughs> at the time. You make the place sound quite antiquated now. Oh, right? it was, I mean, the old, the old yes. building was incredible. And, and on the top floor, there was, because it was, it was the lawn market, it's, uh, it's at the bottom, the ground bit's a tea room now next to the, the posh hotel on George IV Bridge. But I mean, it was, there was a scabby old Lothian Council uh, offices, which were all open plan offices, they were, they were horrible. Um, but you know, you were all quite glad to have a place in them, really. But then we were in this really scabby old building next door. But the BBC had these, what, 17th century oak beams that were all painted quite, and fantastic. Right but in the, top, in, in the top floor, there was the most disgusting bathroom you could ever imagine. And I say it was a bathroom, it actually was, it still had the bath in it. 
And I'm sure at least one of our members in the SPGA, the Scottish Parliamentary Journalists Association, tried to have a bath in it one night. <laughs> and he could only get cold water, and it was just horrible. Liz, didn't you, didn't you say that was, uh, you reminded me just earlier about the tunnel, the secret tunnel? Yeah. I know, I, I said that to somebody earlier on about the tunnel, and they looked at me like, Oh my goodness, she's gone completely. I don't know what's going <laughs> this on. This wasn't MSPs trying to get out. No, no. it was. Yeah, the building, the building was very interesting. Um, yeah, there was a tunnel between. You laugh, and maybe it's real. And um, there was a tunnel between um, the two buildings. The, the committee chambers were in one building, and the other building had the offices, yeah. MSPs offices, and it was linked to um, to the press as well. So we had a free reign to kind of wander across to their offices um, and then down to the canteen at the bottom and then we could go through the tunnel across to the committee chambers. The thing about the tunnel was I was slightly apprehensive about going through the tunnel. Um, we all had, you know, we all had passes to get through different parts of the building. So you had to swipe your pass to open the door to go through the tunnel and then walk along the tunnel to the other door that you had to swipe your pass in. And I was kind of big deep breath and praying that when I swiped the pass, that door would also open because I did not want to be stuck in the middle. You kind of take, you know, take a couple of friends with you, journalists that you've been eating lunch with and go, okay, we're going to the committee room. That's, that's fine, I'll come with you too. We'll all go because we're all stuck under. There's a few of my former the colleagues building. still in there, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can't get out. Hand, hand picked. Um, yeah, with a choice of hostel rooms as well. There was the. We did. Uh, if, if you were going to a, a place where everybody was open and chatty, that was Deacon Brodie's. The place where the SNP went to plot was, I think, the Jolly Judge down the wee, the wee tunnel. And the Labour plotting one was the Beau Bar down Victoria Street. So, depending upon the sort of story you were after, you chose carefully. <laughs> you know, if you want to be collective, in, in the, there, was, there was a fire alarm in the in the, 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 the building we were squatting in, in, in the lawn market. And I, and I picked up three stories in Deacon Brodie's while that was taking place. It was excellent. It was a great, great <laughs> idea. Yes. The we might come back to this, the relationship oh, between journalists, um, politicians, and, and, and alcohol, yeah. uh, which is a, a tricky one. I'm just conscious that this is for uh, yeah, participation yeah, events. So catch my eye if you want anything. Um, also, for those who are on social media, uh, we're using the hashtag FOP2019. That's uh, Festival of Politics. you were going to say for a second. Yeah, <laughs> FOP. <laughs> no, 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 no. Fre it's Festival of Politics yeah. 2019. Uh, and I'll be logging on just to take some questions later. Um, but yes, on, on that, the, the, um, the, the, the relationship between um, Parliament uh, uh, politicians and journalists. Yeah. Um, it's a tricky one, isn't it? I mean, because... Particularly because tricky for Elizabeth. Well, Colin mentioned earlier that, um, that all the politicians started with a real sense of um, idealism and hope behind the problem, but so did the journalists. So you'd think, you know, engage in a common mission, but the, the relationship is not always a good one. But I, I think there was idealism and hope in the, in the period running up to the, the creation of the parliament for the press, and I think the, for, for many of the press. The press, had, many of them had campaigned <coughs> for the creation of a... The Scottish Parliament, some who were old enough had campaigned for the creation of the Scottish Assembly. And, and so when it, when it was created, there was, there was a kickback. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the, the Parliament got a kicking in the early days. It frankly deserved a kicking with the way it was. It didn't seem to prepare properly for the, for the transition. It didn't last very long. And then, of course, you had the problem of um, this place. You know, you had TBB, that bloody building. And, and that, 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 that for, for a period, um, threatened to undermine the entirety of the the, the devolution um, prospectus. It really did. People were sick of it. They were sick of the rising costs. They were sick of the delays, and they turned that into a disquiet with Parliament more generally. Again, that didn't last. But I recall doing a piece which I, uh, I named in my brain, uh, what's left of the brain, I named it There Goes the Neighbourhood. And I was speaking to people around the area here and asking what they thought of the Parliament. I got various views uh, from, you know, usable to, to, to abuse. But, but I, the, the one I remember was the guy who was an army, an army vet from the Whitefoot House and he was drinking in the pub that is now called the, the Kilderkin, but it was called Jenny Haas in those days. And he said, he turned, I asked him, what do you think of the Parliament? She says, I had the Parliament, Ryan, the Parliament, the Parliament. She says, for the front, it's like an upmarket bingo hall. And for the back, for the back, Brian, for the back, it's like a Hong Kong brothel. <laughs> and he paused and he said, and I'm speaking from experience, by the way. You know, <laughs> so, so we ran that at the top of the show. Who, who would live in a building like this? You know, run this thing. Yeah. But remember that, that, that sort of thing. But then that died down. People visited the place, and it's now one 
all the architectural awards that are going, and I think people have, have steadily got to, 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 to uh, love it. But I also agree with, with um, Colin's point that from we, I thought there'd be a transition at which um, the focus of the body politic would shift to, we still called it holiday because we knew we were going there, but to the, to the parliament. It, 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 it was like that. It was about a week. You know, after the nonsense died down, it was a, it was, it was a few weeks, and, and, and the, you know, the parliament eventually became, uh, pretty quickly, the, 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 the fulcrum of debate generally for Scotland. Mm. Well, just well, in those early years, there was, there was genuine points where you wondered if it would last. Yeah. Especially you know, there were, there, and, and a lot of it was because of the building. Yes. And, and, and then after Donald Dewar died very suddenly, you know, there, there, was, there was genuine concerns about whether the parliament could actually last. And also, there was so much criticism uh, at Westminster of the parliament, and they were just so utterly dismissive yeah, was, of it and the people who were running it that, you know, I mean, even you know, when you were talking to people like, like John Swinney, who was leader of the SNP at that point, um, you know, you, you, you knew that he was actually pulling some of his punches in terms of the scrutiny of things like the Hollywood building because he didn't want the parliament to actually fail. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I don't think it was just him, you know, I think that was actually quite widespread that, you know, there were genuine concerns about that kind of thing. Term, it actually entrenched itself fairly quickly. Absolutely, when, yeah, when because it instantly became absence, that focus. You know, it really did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we, should, we should have mentioned that one as well. Winnie, Winnie opening the parliament, you know, this, That's right, yeah, that the, was... the, the, this parliament which, which adjourned actually, in the year 1707. Etc. You were talking about the guy at, he about at Whiteford House. He wasn't that far wrong because I remember somebody know, telling me... Comment, the brothel <laughs> comment. <laughs> brothel, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely the brothel comment because I remember somebody telling me about the building here was that this bit was the brewery, the old brewery. Yeah, yeah. Then um, Queensbury House had been an asylum and then where the MSP's offices are now had been a brothel. Seems only fitting. Oh, right. In the dim and distant past. <laughs> and to be honest, that's a story that I couldn't just have made up. Someone who knew their history knew that. Yes. Well, I, I've moved from the, the brothel to the asylum, so I'm not sure if that makes sense. Um, so any comments from here from the audience uh, come in? But if I may just explore this, uh, this, this interesting bit about the relationship between us, uh, MSP's that is, and journalists. Um, I'm very you conscious, for example. Them, you? Well, yeah. I say us and then being me because I, I was, I, 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 for the interest, for the interest of openness, I, I was a BBC um, television producer. Worked with worked with Brian and others, in fact, before becoming an MSP. Mm. Uh, Ruth Davidson was a, a BBC news producer. Um, Graham Day, uh, Graham Simpson, they're all uh, former journalists. There's quite a lot of crossover in that direction. Graham uh, Simpson was a sub. That's very different. Oh. oh. <laughs> An honourable oh. profession. I hope Graham's not listening to this program. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Graham uh, Simpson was a, was a sub. Graham Day was a sports reporter, wasn't he? Oh, even worse. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. But, but it is, because it's an interesting. So it's a, so it's a close relationship. We're, we're talking about the, the same issues every day. We're in constant discussion. Um, but does it, is it difficult? I mean, how do you, how do you befriend politicians. What's your relationship like with the politicians that you're covering every day? You muck along generally and you can be extremely amicable and, and, and comradely. But as long as you bear in mind, and the sensible politicians do bear in mind, that there is a distinction. Mm -hmm. uh, the distinction is this. You mentioned earlier positive stories and negative stories. We don't see it that way. We see them all as stories. And, and the, the um, example, you know, we're, we're interviewing a politician on a Monday and they've got some big announcement to make about education spending or something like that. And the, the, the microphones are great. They want a microphone. They want in front of every camera that's going. And the, the story goes out. We want to get the story out. They want to get the story out. Result, everybody's happy when the story goes out on Reporting Scotland. Then the following day, there's some questions about their expenses. And it's the same politician. And we want to interview them for exactly the same reason. We weren't being nice to them on the Monday. We're not being rotten to them on the Tuesday. But on the Tuesday, the microphone is now an instrument of terror and they're, they're hiding from us and running down the street. And the point to bear in mind is, is their perspective has changed, ours has not. It's the same perspective, we just want the story. But it does make, I mean, it's, it's the difficulty between your job and the, the, the humanity of your relations. And, and Elizabeth, I hope you don't mind if we, if we just ask uh, uh, you, because you, you've taken this to extremes, if I may put it. That extremes? Way. I'm not sure that's quite right. <laughs> yeah. BBC was no, no, known as the Marriage Guidance Council at that <laughs> point. <laughs> yes, no, I, I feel like it's, I'm sort of having to confess things. I know yes. I'm married to John Swinney. Um, but yeah, the relationship between politicians and journalists, um, 
I don't report politics now. I, you know, I feel I had to step away from that conflict of interest. I mean, you can imagine, you know, the big story going on back at home. Oh, who has not done the dishes? <laughs> what is going on? So there has to be some distance. But back to where, when we were in the loan market, I think there wasn't that much distance physically between politicians and journalists racing about, um, racing across the Royal Mile to go to the Assembly Hall for the debates. So politicians couldn't get away from us because they had to come out their offices, which, as I said before, we could get to quite easily by just walking across the corridor. But they had to get, they had to get out of their offices to walk across the Royal Mile to vote in the Assembly Hall. And what were we doing? We were hovering about, waiting for them. We could literally doorstep them, across, going across the street every minute of the day, really, as the Parliament went on. And so could the public, which I thought was really interesting. So the public could see the politicians walking back and forth from the committee rooms to the chamber, and we were watching them and trying to get, you know, for stories. But the public could see their politicians walking about the Royal Mile, walking about Edinburgh. And I think that was a powerful point to show that Parliament politicians and journalists were very close to the people, the public. Mm -hmm. That was something Donald Dewey used to comment on, that you would always get your reputation on the Royal Mile when you were going to up, to, up to vote. Yeah. But the one, the, the thing I, I, I'm absolutely, I, I think you're absolutely right. That's one of the things I miss most about the old building was the protests. You used to get some phenomenal Great protests in the, the Royal Mile. Or the fish. Absolutely. But the, there was one the I remember, I think it was nursery nurses um, protesting about pay. And they, they blocked off the entire Royal Mile at the back door of the Parliament. And all the MSPs had to run the gauntlet. Yeah. And, you know, you knew you'd been through a protest at that point. Whereas here, I feel that they're much more closed off from it. Um, because, you know, protests tend to be out there around the corner and the MSPs have actually got to go out and see them. I Whereas in the, those days they had no choice. I love the Scottish Opera demonstration. Remember they were, they, they were and they sang money. at them. And they, they, they stood outside and <coughs> gave a selection of arias from Tosca. It was wonderful. But the President officer is asking about the relationship. You know, one of the worst things about the, the relationship between journalists and politicians, from my point of view, is elections. Because you've spent four or five years training politicians <laughs> to tell you what's <laughs> happening and to give you stories and then they lose their seats and oh, you've got to start again training the next bunch up. Yeah. It's really hard work. Thank you. Yeah. Right, I've got some hands <coughs> me up here. The gentleman just there first and then here and then the lady. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes it, it, your microphone might come on actually with a bit of luck. If, um, if yes, if yes, if you stand up. All right. Stand, yes, your microphone's on there. See your microphone. Okay, That's right. Good. I'm interested in how the Scottish Parliament is reported to the people of Scotland but also more broadly, and in particular how our fellow citizens south of the border are enabled to understand Scotland and what the Scottish Parliament is doing. In particular, recently there was an excellent television series on the BBC by Alan Little called Children of the Devolution, which I hope uh, a number of people saw. I wrote to the chairman of the BBC asking when this was going to be shown south of the border. And I got a nice reply, but no commitment to showing it. And when you think about the fact that the Scottish Parliament has led the way on petitions, has led the way on smoking, and Westminster has come along behind, how do you think on the panel the reporting of the Scottish Car Parliament can enable uh, people south of the border to understand Scotland better? I wonder, uh, Brian or Elizabeth, perhaps start with you, just because you, you do appear on, on national yeah. uh, networks, Brian. Ne ne network, yeah. Network, sorry. Um, appear on national every night, do network from time to time. Um, yeah, I, I, it's, it's a fair point. I, I'm not sure it's, it's particularly our role in, in BBC Scotland to um, act uh, w with a, a, an, an educatory tone towards uh, the, the people south of the border, but it, it, is, it is useful, perhaps, that th those matters are are shared across across the border but I think there is coverage of Scottish politics that's not as widespread in in London as it is in Scotland that's the way it's it's going to be but I think the 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 Parliament here has certainly changed the the 
the nature of Scotland's attitude. I mean, in the past, all we ever wanted to do was to beat England at football at, at Wembley, and now you know, it's completely, totally changed. We've got an international outlook. Now we don't mind who beats England. You know, Germany, Liechtenstein, <laughs> Luxembourg, couldn't care. Less. There was another hand up just there. Yes, that man, gentleman there. Um, a, a slightly broader brush question, since you're all and have been involved in um, reporting politics for 20 years. Um, do you feel a pang of envy, perhaps, for not being in either Westminster, Washington, or Brussels these days? Do you feel your colleagues have perhaps a pretty exciting time of it down there, that, and you're rather dealing at a different level here in Scotland now? Colin, you're, you're shaking your head vigorously there. No, I, I, I go down to, to Westminster every now and again to, to cover bits of Brexit, and my God, no, I don't miss it. I wouldn't. I, I, I've spent an entire journalistic career avoiding working at Westminster. I have no intentions of going starting there now. Um, I can't imagine anything probably more frustrating or annoying as a journalist, particularly a political journalist, if you're trying to to tell people what's going on than covering uh, Washington politics just now, because it's, half the time it seems utterly nonsensical. And, you know, uh, I mean, we, uh, going back to the relationship, we, you tend to trust the politicians that you're speaking to, and you know when they're talking nonsense to you. But in Washington, I mean, Washington how do you discern when they're talking uh, nonsense or not? I mean, it's, I mean it's just it's virtually impossible, I think. So, I, no, I, I would, and also, you know, as a Scottish journalist, well then, you know, this is like, actually for the last 20 years, this has like been my home. Um, and, and sometimes my wife has probably felt it's been like my home here as well. Um, but, you know, it does, it, you know, yeah, this is, what, was, this is what you want to cover. This is what you want to tell people yeah. about. I, 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 was, I was six years in, in Westminster and thoroughly enjoyed the, the, the time there. And, and it was in the, um, most of the 80s. I, I was in, 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 in Westminster when, when it was Thatcher foot and then, the new, the new Labour revolution. I have covered three American elections and I've covered umpteen European summits. So I've had the opportunity to do those. You're right, the balance is, is at the moment tilted particularly towards Westminster, but we are covering Brexit absolutely endlessly. In fact, it's been in three and a half years of covering the same damn story. Uh, is, is getting a little enervating after a period. You know, one, one, one hopes for something, something novel. It, it's, like, it's like sex in middle age. You know, you know how to do it. It's just how to make it new. You know, it's. it's, it's, uh, it's, it's so we catching, haven't gone for sex scandals yet. Yes, I know. <coughs> and there's a few of them. Catherine. I, I was just going to say, actually, some of the things I like best about this Parliament are are some of the things that are very different from Westminster. Um, I haven't spent a lot of time in Westminster. I have. Um, worked down there just for a couple of weeks helping out colleagues down south um, but even in that short time I got enormously frustrated by the fact that there are no time limits on speeches mm -hmm. so people can just go on and on and on and you're literally willing them to stop talking um, so I, I think sometimes feels like that here too <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. uh, also as well we, we have the electronic voting so um, when because uh, we're probably all political anoraks here, certainly, um, when we've been going home and watching, because the House of Commons tends to, to vote later at night, been watching all the Brexit votes, and you're just like, it's so frustrating, waiting half an hour plus for the result of a vote, where here we just press buttons. But you know, it's also quite nice to be able to escape from Brexit as a journalist and actually cover the Justice Committee, for example. Something like, you know, actually something significant that's going on or, you know, the transport bill yesterday. You can actually do that. So, you know, you do remember, it actually does remind you. In a way, that I, I think you probably, if you're at Westminster, you've completely lost sight of it because genuinely they've dealt with nothing else for months. That's right. um, whereas here, you can actually, you, you do actually have to remember that there is life beyond Brexit. And, you know, you've got the transport bill yesterday. There was a fascinating justice committee earlier this week talking about prisons. So, you know, stuff, in, you know, life goes on. There is life beyond Brexit. Now, there's hands going up everywhere here. I'll just start right here. And then the gentleman there. Yeah. Uh, perhaps a, 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 a protest anecdote before my questions. I was in the O Parliament in the Assembly rooms when people, you may remember, tied themselves to the railings in the public gallery with garden ties which left a number of police officers not knowing quite which scissors or secateurs or pliers to find. However, on a more serious note, um, observations from any of you on any European coverage of this parliament? 
um, the coverage which I thought was most unfortunate about some women members when the parliament were first, was first elected in 1999, um, some of the criticism may have been relevant but seemed to be presented with a degree of venom and vitriol which was inappropriate and civic debate has gone and indeed parliamentary debate has worsened. But more interestingly, what the effect you feel of social media, that intensity, that speed, that vitriol has had on public perception and indeed their attitude to the conventional and trusted media. There's a lot in there. I'm going to pick up on one particular point first, if I can, just uh, Elizabeth, yourself and Catherine, because we were talking about this earlier about um, uh, the number of women journalists. Now, I think the comments that were made about um, women MSPs at the beginning, at the, in the first session, uh, that would be before you started, Katrine. Um, but Elizabeth, you were saying that there were only three women journalists, so the press pack itself, it wasn't just the That's politicians, nice. the press pack was predominantly male. And, yeah, that's, and that itself has changed. Do you think it's changed the nature of coverage too? That's a very, a very interesting question because discussing it earlier um, and talking about the number of women who were reporting on the Parliament 20 years ago, we think three, three maybe four, yeah. So there, there, weren't, there weren't many at all who were reporting on the Parliament. Um, but I didn't feel that I was reporting on the Parliament and I was a woman reporting on the Parliament. I was a reporter reporting on the Parliament. I, th I, I don't think I was... Said about it being stories, and you don't yeah. see stories as a, a male or a female. No. You see stories as a journalist. You see a story and you want to tell it. I think so. I think so. I mean, I, I really do think so. I don't think my colleagues at the time, correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, I was just Elizabeth. Um, I was a competitor. I was another journalist. I was out for a story as well. I don't think the, the, my male colleagues really thought I was a no, woman. That we, sounds we, a bit strange. We're, st we're still battling with... Sorry, yes? Of the women MSPs I that were so... We take that point, yeah, but, but I think... Ken, uh, yes, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm also it's interested because we're still, we're still grappling with diversity uh, in all its forms, but gender equality being probably the one that gets the most um, political coverage... Uh, and you know, we haven't moved in terms of uh, equality of representation in the chamber. We're, we're at 37%, we're at 37% in 99. But the journalists have changed uh, slightly, but, slightly, but, but the journalists are nowhere near 37%. No, no. And, and do you think, Catherine, do you think that has, a, do you think that has an effect? Just even, uh, even though you, you're a journalist first uh, and foremost in this coverage, but in terms of the way that um, stories are interpreted or in the day-to-day the -day sexism that exists throughout our society. Do you think that has an effect on, on the coverage? I, I don't think, for me, it doesn't. Uh, I've gone bizarrely and quite groundbreakingly for a couple of years, PA at Holyrood had an all-female team, which I think is mm -hmm. probably the only time that's happened either at Holyrood or Westminster. Um, people have moved on to other posts. I'm still here. Um, others have moved on. Uh, Brian coached one of my staff for the BBC. Um, but, <laughs> but, but now we have an all-male team, apart from myself, um, it's an all-male team. Mm. The way we report stories doesn't change. I think there is, I think the lack of females, and people were disagreeing with me on this, I, I do think the lack of females reporting on the news on politics contributes to a perception that perhaps politics isn't necessarily for females, which I think is entirely wrong, obviously, um, because politics is, is about everybody to me. It's about whatever you are, whatever you want to be. It's about trying to, to help you and, and to make this the be best country it can be. I just don't see any of that manifestation of that. You know, you, you're making that as a, as a statement, but I don't see any particular uh, well, empirical evidence for it at all. The MSPs are elected democratically, we're yeah. not. No, you know, not. We just, it just happens to be what we do. But I think you're right that in the early days, there was a lot of focus on, on the female MSPs. And, and you know, one of the reasons for that, I think, was because it was such a transformation to have so many female politicians up front, because there weren't actually very many female politicians from Scotland at Westminster. Yeah. Okay. You know, so it was actually quite a transformation. And actually, I th from, from my recollections, 
quite a lot of the criticism of some of those female MSPs was actually coming from some of the male MPs at Westminster. And quite a lot of the criticism of the Scottish Parliament was from a lot of those MPs who were still at Westminster. I covered the, in the run-up, again, prior to basically the referendum in 97 and the, the advent of the, the, the bill in the white paper, I covered the, there was a campaign called 50-50, which was the campaign to get uh, equal uh, gender balance in the Parliament when it eventually became established. And I really got quite into that. It was, uh, it was Margaret Curran and uh, Joanne Lamont uh, you know, and, and others from, from uh, other parties as well. But I recall particularly interviewing, it was Maria Fife, and I was you know, being my usual charming self and giving her a hard time in this interview. And she paused and she said, look, Brian, this really matters. Have you got any better ideas? I said, Nah, not really. And that was the that was that, that was the end of the interview. We brought brought it to a, a sharp halt. But I remember also the there were there were the, there was a tremendous desire for 50-50, but there were real practical problems in the way. How did you do it? Did, did you did you place in constituencies and then you find that you know the women were placed in the constituency when the party lost? Did did you zip? Did you insist upon 50-50 as, as a matter of statute. No, you can't do that because the point that, that my, my colleagues here are making is you're choosing politicians first, not, not, a, not, a, not a gender. And so there were real practical objections to that. And in the end, it came down to, I think it was a declaration by the parties. I see the SNP are about to try and do that again this very weekend at their party conference. A declaration by the parties that would seek as, 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 as much as possible. Uh, balance, but you cannot do it uh, entirely and you cannot do it by statute because if you do, you're obviating the first requirement, which is to have as many talented politicians as possible. There's a lot of hands have gone up here, but the gentleman there first and then I'll get some more. Yeah. Yes, just the gentleman there, and hopefully your microphone will come on in a second. Yeah, there yeah. You go. Uh, sorry, yeah. Uh, going back to the relationship between uh, uh, journalists and po uh, politicians, or, or equally journalists, politicians, uh, officials, and SPADs, uh, special advisors who are playing an even more important role. I mean, at the moment, there's a lot of talk down south in, in Westminster about, you know, the role of senior number 10 sources, brackets, Dominic Cummings, close brackets, or whoever. Uh, and, 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 the, and what they're saying, you know, side, journalists sidling up to them in, in Portcullis House or wherever it happens to be, or the Westminster Arms, for all I know, and uh, a being given tidbits, often very contentious and highly, often pernicious pieces of information or an, an uh, anal uh, analysis, which is then complete, is then put out immediately via social media without any kind of checking, without any kind of differentiation. Now, what I'm asking, is that a problem which exists inside the Scottish Parliament or in relations between, you know, the Scottish lobby and the, say, and, the, and, 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 pol and politicians here? I mean, I say that as somebody who worked for maybe a decade as a, as a hack in Brussels, where there was this related problem of the Brussels bubble. Is there a Hollywood bubble as there's a Brussels bubble and a Westminster bubble and, you know, a Berlin bubble probably and a Washington bubble? I think Indeed, anywhere I you have so much hot air has a bubble. Yeah. I think it's a, first it's of all, a blue a, a, excellent question, not yeah, least because right. I've got the same question written down here. But I'll ask you, Colin, because there is clearly, um, and, and I'm sure many people would like to know, what is the role of special advisors, spin doctors here? Each, each of the parties goes out of the way to make sure they employ a press team and they, they, they'll be immediately you out there. a press team. Yeah, of course, yes, yes. So, so but that's the point. I, I, can you explain to everybody how this works. So immediately after First Minister's questions, there'll be a little huddle outside. And just explain to people what, what happens and what, what, what role do these special advisors well, I mean, play? After First Minister's questions, for example, this was much more prevalent actually in the old building than it is now. Um, because there was a proper black and white corridor, which was the bit that we were allowed to talk to people in. And that was actually the only bit of the old building that we were allowed to talk to people in. So immediately after First Minister's questions, the, the Labour spin doctors, the um, SNP spin doctors would all come out and try and tell you what they got out of First Minister's questions and how good their guy was, and in those days it was a guy, um, how good their guy was at First Minister's questions. And, you know, you would listen sometimes politely, sometimes not very politely, and then you would go away and do what you were going to do anyway. Correct. Um, because as an experienced journalist, um, which I was, to be fair, I wasn't in those days, but I, did, I, I learned it from people like Brian, from just watching the way they work. And, and learning from people that you, you respect and trust, um, that actually it doesn't matter what they tell you. What matters is 
your interpretation of what they tell you. And you, you work out what's right and what's wrong. And you do, really, ultimately, you do need to get it from the politicians themselves mm -hmm. because they're the ones that have been elected. They're the ones that count. And, you know, the, the, spin, but, doctors, but the spin doctors can be very useful in, you know, because you don't always have to go to the, 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 the political leader, for example. And they can be very useful in, in, in disseminating some of that information and explaining things to you. But sometimes, just again, I mean, for example, last week there was a story um, about the Conservative leadership. Um, and an awful lot of it was sources say. Now, again, what, what does that mean for, for the Quite public? Quite often that's a politician themselves who just doesn't want to be quoted in newspapers, mm -hmm. particularly. Um, but, but, but it's, it's, more difficult, it's more difficult on the telly because obviously you need to see who you're interviewing. Mm -hmm. um, and actually you can see, you know, you can actually hear it from them. Whereas in the papers, yeah, you can quote sources in the papers and it's not mm -hmm. quite not quite as clear. And, and, and quite often it is from the politicians themselves, they just don't want to be named. Yeah, that's a tremendous mm -hmm. question for my friend. I would just mm -hmm. dissent from one thing. It generally wasn't the Westminster Arms when I was there. It was the Red Lion, because it's much closer to Downing Street, and that was where Charlie used to hold, hold court when you were trying to get information about the, about the Labour Party. But yeah, it's absolutely true that the, the, you, you approach individuals who are on the inside track in search of information. We're trying to get stories. We're trying to get stories, but Colin's 100% right as well. You don't take it undiluted. You don't sort of take down the perils of wisdom. Oh, that's great stuff. Let's go and do it. We do check things. You know, we check it out. I know sometimes it doesn't seem the case. I think you made the point about social media. That's a different point. Some some people rushing into, into print with some item of gossip that they have heard uh, and have not um, checked. That, that's not that's not what we do. It's not not the line that the, that we take. But are we looking for information from anywhere we can? You bet we are. You bet we are. <laughs> but you then check it. You test it against what you know from elsewhere, what you know is likely to be the case. Um, the business of sources is just sometimes it's necessary to, somebody doesn't want to speak on the record, you have to protect what they're saying, but it's more important to get the story out. Katrine, can I ask you, because the presentation clearly has a slightly different um, um, way of reporting. Yeah, no, and, and we would certainly never put anything out without checking it first. We would never, never do that. That's just not what we do. Um, we have to be a reliable news agency of record um, and people will get news from elsewhere and that's fine. Um, but one thing that does concern me about the growth of all these media websites and bloggers and, and people taking their news from Twitter is that the news that they get is sometimes more infused with opinion than, than actual hard news. Um, and facts, but even just thinking about the the relationship between politicians and the media and kind of how that's changed over the the last 20 years and, and how that's changed as the media has changed. Um, when this parliament was set up, most people were probably still getting their news from a daily paper in the morning and watching the tea time bulletins. Now people want news 24 seven. So there is always a rush to get that out. Um, and it has changed the way I think that politicians interact with the media in that when I started here, you were much more likely to get politicians doing huddles with lots of press journal, lots of print journalists, um, because I primarily do print, unlike my colleagues um, on the panel. Um, they would take lots of questions from print journalists and, and spend a lot of time with us. Whereas now, more often than not, they'll do a quick clip with the tele camera and, and the journalist will maybe get three questions. And if we're lucky, we'll be allowed to come along and listen in and hold our dictaphones under it so we can get a comment that we can use, whether that be from the first minister, the prime minister or whoever. But there's much less openness and interaction with with print journalists and much less politicians being prepared to open themselves up to the sort of more detailed scrutiny that you get when you have one politician and maybe 12, 15 journalists standing around them saying, but what about that? But what about that? And, and, and putting them under a bit of pressure. That doesn't happen so much. Mm. Uh, Elizabeth, um, going, going back to when you were with, again with the papers before going to uh, tell you, um, there would be pressure from your editors, though, wouldn't there? I mean, not to, uh, I mean, I, without having a go at journalists, the, 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 if, if you don't get a story and all the other papers have it, uh, particularly in politics, that's, that can be quite difficult editorially uh, with, with, with your editor back at the desk. Well, of course, yeah, of course, with any story, not only politics, any other kind of story, 
Um, and, and there was a bit of a press pack, a, uh, you know, a pack mentality, maybe at the start of the parliament. But there was still a bit of individualism and we all wanted to get an exclusive story. There was no, no getting away from that, really. But we did operate as a pack at quite a lot of the time. Um, it was interesting in the old building, because um, I was in the office, there were two of us. Um, I think, well, you were on your own in a cupboard, I think. Um, there were, you know, the newspapers were, in, you know, individually well, in your offices. So, yeah, it had a key, but it had a key yeah. like. and, and this big office we talked about where there were lots of, lots of the papers were in this big open plan office. But you could always tell that the pack had their story, but somebody else within the pack maybe had their own exclusive story. And the reason you could tell that was their door was shut. <laughs> Or they weren't really talking to you as much as you thought they usually did. Mm. Or when you went to speak to them, or you want to get a coffee, you want to do this, they weren't there, they were outside. Especially the, the non-smokers were outside. Oh. And you think, okay, they've got a scoop and I haven't, I need to try and track that down. So there was a pack mentality, certainly at first, and you know, broke off at different stages. But mm. Of course, there's a, you want everyone to get a story. Indeed, but I'm trying to explore the control they have. A woman right at the back row there, yes. I was just wanting to oh, add... I, well, yes, go first, and then we'll have you in the back row. Okay. <laughs> I was just wanting to add the complexity that it comes to us when the social media story, which could be just ignored, is picked up in whatever direction, pol politics in every other direction, and made part of the mainstream media where it doesn't need to be. Have you, have you got any particular example? Or you, you just I think I just get frustrated when um, at the bulletin at six o'clock is talking about something that has happened during the day and somebody has tweeted something about it. I mean, of course, Donald Trump does, so of course it has to be part of the story, but sometimes you feel it's getting too much emphasis if it was ignored, if it was ignored and the direct interviews were much more where we got our news, then it could have less impact than it is now having. It, yes, it did. Well, first of all, I don't know if anybody wants to comment, perhaps well, you call it about the, the great and unmatched wisdom of our uh, yeah, politicians here. He is the evidence, as he said here once. Yeah, yes, um, yes. No, I, I don't disagree with you, but the, the, as a journalist, you have to make that judgment. If they're not going to do an interview with you, you still want to be fair and balanced about it, so you have to report that side of the story. And if the only way you've got to do that is by telling everybody what they said in their tweet, because not everybody watches Twitter, then that's, that's the only way you can do it. Because increasingly, um, and this is something that you were touching on, and you were touching on, uh, Katrina, as well, is that increasingly politicians will shy away from that direct scrutiny, and they'll just put a comment out on Twitter, and that's all you've got. Um, and then they'll hide from you, and they'll just not speak to you. And therefore, they are just not up to that scrutiny. And in, in a way that, obviously, at the start of the Scottish Parliament 20 years ago, there was no such thing as Twitter. There was no Facebook. Um, and the only way they could get their message across to you, the voters, was through us. But now, they've got so many other opportunities to do that, that they will avoid the scrutiny that, you know, Brian and I would give them in, in, in the course of an interview, for example. Katrine. And I think, as well, that the other reason, really, why we can't ignore Twitter is quite often, we have a First Minister, for example, who's really active on Twitter now has more than a million followers um, and quite often she'll tweet her take on on Brexit related events or other events much much quicker than you'll get a press release through from the Scottish government telling you the first minister's views on it so as a journalist you're always wanting to get that story out and get it out quickly so you do you you will take the first minister's co comments from Twitter it's a verified source um, and it will be pretty much the same comments that are put out several hours later by somebody in the Scottish Government press office. Quite often it's done for a purely practical speed reason. But, but to reassure our friend here makes an excellent point. We're, we're not content with that. We would go for an interview in the first place, a combative interview or a discursive interview. If not that, we want to comment directly to, to the BBC rather than indirectly through 
social media, and we'd only take that as a, as a last resort. You're right, it can be, it can be dangerous. There's another development which is some politicians and organizations do a thing called a VNR, which is a video news release, and they seem to feel that we should run this on, on television. We, we resolutely refuse to do so. Can I ask you, Brian, how many stories do you get? I mean, I'm, I'm conscious, for example, one of the biggest stories today and yesterday has been the, um, the, the uh, Colleen uh, Rooney versus Rebecca Vardy story, which has all come out through social media. Yeah. How, how many... But that, I mean, that's a, that's a story that everyone's fascinated by. Not everybody. Okay. No, definitely some, not. Some, <laughs> some people are fascinated by it. Um, I had to ask colleagues many, who they were before. That, that, story, <laughs> that, that story broke, obviously, through Instagram and social media. Where, how many story, how many political stories do you actually get from social media as opposed to that get from... A, 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 very, very few. I, I, would, I would seek, seek information elsewhere. very few originally I don't read Twitter, so I, would, I would never get them from Twitter, so I, I don't... It's more, it's, more a, it's more a comment adding to a story, isn't it? Yeah, oh yeah, I'm, 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 I, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not the one to comment. I, I, I look elsewhere for information. I mean, but just that President Trump clearly generates a yeah, lot of stories. That's, that's political true. stories through social media... We use social media in this country a lot, but I'm not sure we've quite uh, got to the stage where political, the main political stories, hardly any of them ever seem to emerge through social media. As but far as I can see, because there's no scrutiny I'm not there. Complaining, I'm just saying. You know, I mean, yeah. if, if you want your politicians to be scrutinised, because you don't always get the chance to do it yourself, so that's part of what we are for. That's right. We're asking is to do that for you. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, as Brian says, the questions that we ask tend to be the questions that. Maybe not all of you want to know, but somebody, wants, somebody somewhere wants to know them generally. Who is Colleen Rooney? And, no. No, the Brian's <laughs> already dealt with that. <laughs> the woman at the back, row, please. Thank you. If we agree, for example, that coalition can be a very positive thing, do you think there was any difference in the early days, especially in the coverage or emphasis that the international press brought to the Parliament? Because my impression was that for example, the German press covered the policies of the parliament, while the home press was just a wee bit too involved at the building. Well, I wonder, it's, it's, it's probably quite difficult. Do any of you have an international perspective? I, I was very conscious during the independence referendum, for example, there were a sea of um, uh, tents and caravans and lorries parked outside. You could hear every single language, you know, um, from Glaswegian to Aberdeen, no, no. Yeah, every single language uh, was, 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 was there. Um, One of my personal the highlights during the independence referendum was explaining to a lovely Spanish journalist from Barcelona um, at a breakfast briefing in Aberdeen what a row he was. <laughs> he, he was. He was quite perplexed, I think, by what looked a bit like a sort of roadkill croissant. Oh, no. um, <laughs> apologies if anybody's from Aberdeen. I, th I, think it's th th I think the difficulty with the, that question is that it's difficult um, from here to, to compare our, our coverage, unless you're in Germany or, or France. But um, there's no doubt, I mean, our, our own coverage of foreign affairs is more objective and impartial and less gossipy than it would be if it was close at home. A uh, gentleman there that was waving had his hand up for a, for a long time with a bit of paper. There you are. Cheered you up now. Thank you. Thank you. My question has been taken, so I'll go for my second one. Uh, if the panel could go back to a period in Scottish history that they would really have liked to report on, what would it be? <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to report on the, the, the Darien adventure. Darien's I'd good. like to have got right to the, the heart of that, the Company of Scotland trading to the West Indies and found out what, the, what they were actually all about. Um, I'd like to have found out whether the individual who, who also, I believe, founded the Bank of England uh, was reputable or whether he was a rogue. Um, the, it's exactly, it is, it, is, it is open to interpretation, but I, I'd, I'd like to have covered that, that particular story and the consequences that it had. Any yeah, others? But, but, but we've actually done some of the best stories oh, no. because we've done the establishment of the Scottish Parliament in 1999, which, let's face it, we're all here just now. Oh, no. it, it's pretty big. And then we did the referendum in 2014. Pretty so big. actually, we've had some of the best stories to cover, haven't we? Yeah. We, we absolutely have, um, and, and 2014 was amazing, and it did at the time feel like it was a real one-off, and you felt the eyes of the world were all on Scotland. Um, whether or not it's a one-off, I guess time will tell, um, but I'm always fascinated by women in politics, um, so I would love to have interviewed Margaret Thatcher. Um, I started reporting in 
the early 90s and I covered some things with John Major at the very, very start of my career, but I never got to see the Iron Lady. Um, and I think whether you love her or loathe her, she's a woman who had considerable influence and I would have loved to have been able to interview her. Because you got to. You're talking about that as if it's historical. <laughs> to me, it's, it's contemporary. I interviewed her, but the one interview I remember particularly with, 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 with Margaret Thatcher was the day she announced she was standing down as an MP. She happened to be in Scotland. She was first of all out at a, a mug deck at some sort of fundraiser then, and then she went to Cumbernauld to open, is it Westerwood Hotel, the Westerwood Hotel, and I found out she was Before going I'm there, there. And pursued her there. I, I chased her through the hotel. The, 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 our aides were trying to get her away, and I was chasing her through the kitchen. And I was shouting, Margaret, Margaret, Lady Thatcher. By then, she was about to become a baroness. And then I genuinely forgot, and I shouted, Prime Minister. And she'd been, she'd been stood down for two years by then. And I said, God, I said, Margaret, I am so sorry. She said, it's OK, Brian. After 11 years, I find it hard to get used to as well. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and after, after that, I got a 40-minute interview. I couldn't get rid of her. You know? <laughs> so it was, it was marvellous. <laughs> okay, now, there's a, a lady there. Be waiting very patiently. Yes, just there. Changing the subject slightly into lovely, nice things to say. It's such a privilege to be sitting here in this parliament and to be sitting here with journalists who report Scotland. For decades and decades, I and many others who are no longer here fought to get this place established and to sit here and listen to the questions and the, the debates is wonderful. And I think sometimes many of the younger people, I hate to use that expression because it makes me sound as if I'm old, which I'm not, but um, somehow don't realize what has gone into the fact that we are here. And now to my media story, because it goes back to the days, I think, when we had our first Parliament meeting and I was on the streets of Edinburgh and I watched media in a different way reacting that day. There we were standing as all the MSPs walked and what a thrill to see the, the combination of all the different parties, everyone happy and smiling. And then the final thing in that um, display that day was I shouldn't say march by, but it was the march by. The Queen was there, and all the children in Scotland, uh, had, children in Scotland had been picked to march past the Queen. And I'm sort of standing there waiting for this. And then I saw this incredible figure, handsome, beautifully dressed, Sean Connery. <laughs> <laughs> and Sean Connery sat himself underneath the days where the Queen was. And the children are all coming along, and then you heard the voice, Sean Connery, Sean Connery, Sean Connery. And every eye went not to the Queen, but to the medium star, Sean Connery. The picture of him his legs spread with that kilt and that <laughs> smile <laughs> will go down in history and in my memory forever. <laughs> uh, if, if, if this had been a sitting of the chamber, I would have asked you to get to the question sooner, yeah, but there no, we are. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. Yes, you said that. Mate, I was just going to say that. I think we do a fantastic job. Good man. Uh, if you if you're watch the Scottish news, you're all it's fantastic. You mount awesome. The coverage you get for the Scottish but, Parliament is absolutely yeah. amazing. But, <laughs> I thought I'd just do that for you. Uh, is it not too much? Because I, I think you missed it. That we never got enough information from Europe in the past. We don't get enough information about the local governments and what they're doing. Yeah. And I think there's an awful lot of... The reporters are being taken off now from television and newspapers. You see the Herald now is just opinion rather than reporting. So people don't know the story that's coming up. You used to have the report. So, so it's very difficult. For instance, the factory that closed down in uh, Dundee, the tyre factory, somebody said to me, who knew that Dundee had a big tyre factory? You know, nobody knew it. Uh, the, everybody in the parliament wanted the new bridge over the fourth, the ferries, 
the new hospital in Glasgow, the big new hospital, but they were all underfunded. They were all almost half underfunded by the own matrix of the people that were building them. But because everybody was agreed that we needed those, there didn't seem to be any, anybody complaining that they weren't done properly. I mean, the, the bridge is too small anyway, and you know, all these kind of things. But the, the, I think the point there is about the, the difference between what people want to read and what, what you cover. Uh, Elizabeth, yourself, I mean, do you, as a journalist, for example, are you um, under pressure to uh, deliver stories that will sell papers, grab audiences, um, or under pressure to deliver the more worthy um, stories that um, are of greater significance, as it were? Well, I think stories are stories. Stories are things people want to read. And that's, that's what sells papers. That's what people watch on the news and listen to on the radio. I don't, I mean, stories are stories. And you, you know... Yes, but I don't if you want to compare, to... let's say, I mean, one of the many scandals, let's say Tommy Sheridan and various... Um, yeah, I'm trying to work out how to word this, swinging yeah. stories, whatever, study, study. Uh, versus yeah. uh, coverage of the Justice Committee, which Colin was telling us earlier this week, is fascinating. It was on Tuesday. Yeah. Not every week, but, you know, it was well, well, on Tuesday. Which, which would you read, if you're writing for the Scotsman again, which would your uh, readers wish to have, um, and which would your editor like to have? Well, Why can't you have both? Yes, well, I was just I, going I, to I say going that. To say you, you would probably want both, because the Justice Committee was doing things like talking about things like prison overcrowding, delays to Berlin, use of drugs in prison. Um, and actually, you can make that cross over with the Tommy Sheridan well, story yeah. because he was in Berlin. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a two for one. Really. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yes, uh, so actually, yeah. nowadays, your editor would make you do both of those stories at the same time because yeah. of cuts. Actually, that, that is probably one of the, 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 the obvious answers to your yeah. question is that Actually, we don't have the resources anymore. So we need more journalists, really. Yeah. I, I, more I think stories. as well that, yeah. that one of the things about the establishment of the Scottish Parliament is it's taken a lot of the power away from local government. Um, local government in, in Scotland, and I'm thinking back, this is back more to probably when I was a student and before I was a journalist, but local government in Scotland was the opposition to the, to the Thatcher era. Um, and then the Scottish Parliament came along and it's become the opposition to, to Westminster on issues like austerity and Brexit. And decision-making has become more centralised here than, than spread out. I think, you know, the consultative steering group, um, the group which kind of drew up the blueprint for Holyrood, they published a, a report this week looking back at the, the last 20 years of the Scottish Parliament. And one of their complaints was the fact that that devolution hasn't really spread out from beyond Holyrood. Um, so there's not as much physically happening at local government level to report on. Um, well, that goes right back to where we started. If, the, if this place has become the focus, it's had to take the focus from other places. Like yeah. I was saying earlier about the General Assembly used to get a lot of coverage in Scotland. Yeah. You know, the Scotsman, Herald, you know, had reporters, you know, there who are now here as political reporters and the General Assembly, I think it's fair to say, has, has less coverage in newspapers and, and on television and radio. So is that the same stories being covered, just not in the General Assembly, because we're hearing about it from the political point of view, from the Parliament's point of view as well. Yeah. So has the Scottish Parliament taken the place of the General Assembly? Of you know of Strathclyde Regional Council, all these places, mm -hmm. is it just a change of the focus, a change well, the, of the emphasis? The, the papers, as you can tell by their thickness, there are fewer journalists working for the papers mm -hmm. than, than there used to be. But I'll just put a plug in. By the way, the, the members of the Constitutional uh, uh, Steering Group will be here tomorrow night uh, in this uh, building to discuss that very report. If you're interested in that, gentlemen in the very back row there, yes. There we are. I could ask the panel, um, if they look back over their career, who is the, perhaps the, the sharpest political operator that they have encountered? Oh, that's a good Ooh. question. Eh? We're all looking at Brian because he's... Because <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah, laughs> yeah, no, no, I'm old. <laughs> um, I, I uh, often use a, a great literary work when I'm asked to make comments of that. And that great literary work is, of course, 
uh, Alice in Wonderland, and uh, <laughs> Lewis Carroll tells us they all have won and all must have prizes when he's talking about the race, and I, I would certainly say that. I uh, you were going to say they were, we were all mad in here. No, we're, no you know, they, that's right. You, you don't have a choice. Everybody has to be mad to be here. Yeah? <laughs> no, I, uh, the ones I have in, enjoyed interviewing most, perhaps, would be, would be the, the, the ones I would do there. It tends to be prime and, and first ministers. The ones I find combative, certainly Margaret Thatcher, uh, very, very much so. Tony Blair, in his later years, once he had lost the, the, the early, slightly glib approach that he, that he took in, 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 the, in the, the days, each of the first ministers has had um, uh, a lot to recommend them in terms of being combative uh, interviewees. But, you know, Nicola is, is extremely uh, up for a straightforward discussion. She will address the question that you put. That's the way I, I judge the, the, the best, perhaps. And I recall doing an interview, this is a daft story, but I called doing an interview with John Major, uh, which took place, and for some reason, a reason that passes me, he was probably flying out somewhere else, at Prestwick Airport. It was a long, long interview. Towards the, the end of his period, you know, things were not going all that great for him. And we, got a, we, we arranged a makeup artist to come down and to do this, this big interview that I was doing with John. And he, he tried to make a, a joke, and he said to the makeup artist, um, after his spinning image portrayal, any way you could make me look a little less grey. <laughs> and the, the makeup artist had only just arrived. She'd found it difficult to find the airport. She'd find it even more difficult to park and even more difficult to get through the special branch to get into the place. And she said, I'm a makeup artist, no an effing magician, you know. <laughs> 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 to, his, to his credit, John roared with laughter at the, at the comment. So I, 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 like, I, like, I like the politicians who address the questions, they may not answer it the way that you always want, but they take it on, uh, and I like the ones that have got a sense of humour as well. And I like the politicians um, who accept that I'm quite a short reporter. I say that because interviewing Donald Dewar was a very interesting proposition <laughs> for myself. But Donald Dewar and myself, we understood, the, at this point of working for television, yeah. he, they are, he understood what television required. So I had a box to stand on. <laughs> and we did this interview in the black and white corridor, and we're doing the interview, it's all very serious, I'm getting the interesting answers, I know I've got my clip. My colleagues <laughs> from the press corps are kind of wandering about, listening to the inter interview, but mostly laughing <laughs> at me on a box. But don't you just... Was shook his box, head at it, you. Or was it a plastic crate? It was a, it was no, a pedestal. We sure. put you on a, a pedestal. Yeah, that was it, yeah. it was pedestal. a box, but he understood why we were doing that. I understood one, why we were doing that. But, but Donald Dewey was actually no quite idea. funny when you interviewed him. There was one time I, I remember interviewing him in the early years of the Parliament, and, and I was pretty new to it all, um, and I was interviewing him for the radio. And uh, we were in his office in St Andrew's house, and it was the one with the, the you know the, the scary walnut, oh, devilly yeah. pictures on the wall because it's all spooky images. Just the way it's, I don't like it's, that. It's, it's, Henry didn't like that office; he had to no, move out move. because it scared them. Um, but I was interviewing Donald Dewar, and I'd asked him something, and it was probably vaguely cheeky. And he said, "Colin, you'll notice I'm scratching my nose." <laughs> <laughs> and he thought, ah, "Very good," because it was radio, so nobody else could see it except me. <laughs> Gentlemen, right there, there's two of you, but uh, the old one first and then the younger one. <laughs> yes, um, well, I've, maybe I'm... He's not sure whether he's the old one or not. Good, good on you, sir. Well done. Oh, thank, you. Right, uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, continuing on the stories, I wonder if any of you witnessed or, in fact, reported on an incident that actually happened in this very chamber. A few years back now, I was up there with a student teaching him English, and I had given him a bit of background to this place, saying it was totally non-confrontational. We all sat in the same kind of direction. We weren't in any way going to start shouting at each other or do anything that it would upset anybody. And it was you mentioning Tommy Sheridan's socialist group that suddenly I remembered an incident when everybody in that party started to get up and walk out one by one. They didn't like what they just heard. My friend who was with me said, I thought you said this place was decent and nobody was confrontational. Did any of you remember that story when they, that actually happened? I, 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 I remember that, that protest. I remember another occasion. Sometimes everything that happens in here is not always written down in the official report. The official report is a is a, 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 a sanctified version of, of what is said. And I swear, and to this day, I will still find out. 
I swear that on one occasion, Jack McConnell finished a speech by saying, I'm havering, so I'm going to sit down. It was the most yeah. honest speech I've heard in 40 yeah. years of covering, it was covering first politics, because he questions. was havering. And, it, and I looked up the official report, it wasn't there. No. Thought, it was oh, at First that. Minister's questions. It was, it was. It was in response cues, to yeah. Nicola when she was standing in for Alex Hammond when yeah. he was down the road. Um, and and I, was losing I, it. I thought he said, I'm blethering, I'm I'll just sit down. Yeah. It was something like that. Blethering yeah. yeah. or havering, I think, I think he said havering. To be fair, Jack did haver quite a lot at the First Minister's questions. I would it never make such a value <laughs> judgment. <laughs> not, it, um, it, did, it did happen. It's not confined right. only to Jack. It got some coverage. Indeed. The gentleman next to you, the, the, the clearly very young gentleman. Uh, uh, were you at school with him? Uh, or something? Uh, referees in Scotland are often accused of favouring one team or another. As political journalists, do you ever get accused uh, from politicians of uh, perhaps letting your own political leanings uh, slide into your reporting? Not what? by politicians, by people on Twitter every day, yes. absolutely every day. I mean, the, after the march on Saturday, which I covered, and actually one of the reasons I covered the march on Saturday... I you choose your language carefully. Not I am, no, no, I'm not going to tell you what I said. <laughs> no, one of the reasons I, I covered the march on Saturday was because actually one of the editor, the editor phoned me up on Friday and said, look, you're working tomorrow. You've already got all these days off in lieu we don't want to add to it. Why are you covering it? And I said, well, actually, because I don't want one of the young reporters to have to cover it and then get all the hassle that you get after something like that when you refuse to put a number on it. I'm like, I'm an Alawa supporter. I'm not used to big crowds. I can't estimate how big that was. Um, you can only tell people what you feel. Um, but yeah, I, you get it more from people on Twitter, for example, or Facebook or whatever than you ever get from politicians because the politicians see you doing it to everyone and see that you interview everyone pretty much the same and you give everyone pretty much the same kind of hard time that you give them. Give them all Whereas I think from a, a party supporter, for example, they only really pay attention to what you're doing to their person or whatever like that. And, and so they have, and you know, I'm, not, I'm not complaining about it at all, but they only look at it from that perspective, which is fair enough, because that is their perspective. Um, but the politicians, I, I've, I've never had that from the politicians. Malcolm, you're telling us a good story, but uh, you, were, you were booed recently and asked a question and then... I was, during the 2017 uh, election, um, I was at the SNP manifesto launch in Perth Concert Hall. And, and I think I'd, I'd asked the First Minister, uh, she, she'd been saying that, you know, a, a, a big increase in the SNP vote would show that they had a mandate for another independence referendum. So my question was pretty obvious as a journalist. Well, if you don't get that increase, surely that shows that you've not got as much of a mandate. And I got loudly booed by the, by the, by the, the, the folk at the, at the launch. But then the very next day, and I obviously bothered, but the very next day, um, I, was doing, I was interviewing Willie Rennie about his manifesto launch. It was a much smaller affair. Um, and it didn't have the big, big audience or anything like that. It just had... Um, Lord and Lady Ming Campbell standing in the corner and every time I asked Willie an awkward question all you heard was <laughs> so one day I was booed by it felt like the entirety of the SNP and the next day I was tutted at by the Lib Dems <laughs> so you get, you get it from all sides nobody tuts quite like Elspeth Campbell absolutely man. <laughs> absolute pro she is one good you tutter. couldn't quite hear it on the telly but Willie Rennie could hear it and I could hear it and we were almost <laughs> wetting ourselves laughing at it <laughs> Yeah, I'm conscious we're coming to a, a, an end now, so catch me if you want one last question. I was going to put a question again to all the journalists. The, the, um, um, a few things I wanted to mention, but which I haven't, but one of the things, there's been a, a number of high-profile resignations. Um, uh, uh, Henry McLeish, David McCletchie, Wendy Alexander, quite a few, even just more recently, not on the same scale, but Julian Martin when she was first appointed. And in each case, it was a press pack. I mean, it was, it was something happened. N none of them were crimes. They were all, you know, misunderstandings or failure to communicate, whatever else. Um, they all became the eye of the media storm. They all became the centre of attention, and they got that press pack hounding them at one point or other. Now, we all know what it's like. What, can I just ask you to explain, what's it like from the media perspective in that? Are, are you aware of, of uh, you know, how that feels? Um, the actual uh, political momentum that generates, for example, because uh, David McCletchie and the, and the taxis, for example, he ended up having to step down as leader over that. And in some ways, it's because a story runs and then it runs and then it runs for another day and you become the centre of attention. I think Wendy Alexander, very similarly, uh, and she ended up having to step down as leader. Um, this was about failure. Uh, she accepted 
donations from a non-tax uh, non-resident. Jersey, yeah. yeah. Jersey interview. So, so I mean, it, it, it sort of goes beyond political. It goes beyond the rights and wrongs. It becomes a matter of judgment, and then becomes you become the story, and you get in the way. What's it, can I just ask what it's like from the press point of view? Well, we didn't start with any of that. I'll just point out. We're I'm, just, I'm we're, we're just, fall, we're just reporting just, it. Just, um, you know, I mean, we didn't make any of those expense claims, taxi claims, whatever. Um, the one, the one, the one. We shouldn't have. Yeah, well, the one, the one I remember most recently was when Kezia Dugdale came back to Parliament from the jungle. Yes. And actually, your office gave me hell for this because um, the officer's office. I, I was, pres I, I was, I was chasing her, literally chasing her through the Parliament because actually, in those circumstances, we'd been told that she would speak to us when she came out. And then she wasn't allowed to speak to us by the party, by the Labour Party, and so they tried to whisk us past her, whisk her past us, and we thought, no, we've got questions to ask you, and we're going to ask you them. And I think I, I ended up chasing her the length of the garden lobby, um, and, and eventually she shouted something over her shoulder to me. Um, but you know, that, again, it's perfectly legitimate. She knew that she was quite happy to talk to us, but she was being prevented from talking to us by a party leadership. She wanted to. So, so actually, she, she would rather have done it, but as it was, the way, going back to her question about spin doctors, going back the way her spin doctors tried to make that happen, they actually made it so much worse than it needed to be. And actually, quite often in some of these instances, spin doctors or others, advisors, have made them worse. Yeah, I, I, the reason I'm, I'm intrigued because what happens is it creates a, 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 a friend, we were talking about the, the bubble earlier, um, of its own, so, and it, then it gets fed into. So opposition politicians will pile in because they sense blood, yeah. essentially, and then it feeds off itself. As I say, we use the word frenzy. Is it something, that, I mean, I, I, I can get uncomfortable about it sometimes. I mean, we, they, I think it was Elizabeth that mentioned a, a pack mentality, and there can be literally a pack mentality, a chase, a hunt, you know, and, and I can get a little uncomfortable with that because we can get, while we are pursuing matters on behalf of the public, and we genuinely are, and, and asking questions on behalf of the public, we can get a bit pompous and sententious and, and self-aware as well. And you have, to, you have to watch that. You have to step back and try and think, is this question legitimate? Is this issue legitimate? But in, in most of the cases you've mentioned, I, I would say that it was. I remember when Hen Henry resigned, um, we were in the lawn market across the road from the parliament, and, and all the MSPs were streaming out. And Brian Innes and I, the cameraman, went chasing out to get the interviews. And uh, we got folk going down the road. I think it was Maureen McMillan said, a good man murdered by the media. And it's always stuck in my um, mind. Uh, I thought, was he murdered by the media? And then I thought, actually, no, he wasn't. He, he was murdered by or brought down by his failure to contain a, 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 a fairly limited scandal, but a scandal that he was unable to, to address and unable to answer. In that sense, it's almost like a gladiatorial or, or a courtroom test where you, you put the two, the two sides. And if, if, the, if the accused can... can um, uh, put forward a decent defence, they're going to get off. And we, unfortunately, in, the, in these cases, are, are in the, the position of being the prosecuting counsel. Yes, yes. And, and, and I'm not in the business and of... it's not a happy a, position. A, a, I'm not saying actually it is. What's interesting is that the, where, the, where, the, bench, where, where the, the benchmark moves, because at the moment, yeah. and certainly in international politics, there's some behaviour which is quite extraordinary that doesn't lead to resignation. Now, I'm just conscious... Oh, there's one last hand. Very well, sir. Well, one brief question, and then we'll have to... Um, I emailed uh, Nicola Sturgeon and Joe Swinston a couple of weeks ago, or a few weeks ago in actual fact, to suggest a, 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 an acronym buzzword to front the Remain campaign going forward. And that buzzword was BRITER, okay, standing for Britain Remaining In Guarantees Homeland Trade Everywhere Routinely. <laughs> and I even suggested a couple of slogans, potential slogans like Dump Black Brexit, Go Brighter Remain, okay? Um, now, uh, again, uh, emphasising that, that BRATER stands for Britain Remaining In Guarantees Homeland Trade Everywhere Routinely. I'm interested in the panel's view on whether that sounds like a potential positive news headline for the Remain campaign going forward. Oh, my goodness. Right. So, so I've got, I've got, I've got to say, sir, lo lo loads of luck with that one. <laughs> <laughs> loads of luck, my friend. I don't yeah. think you'd be doing well if you can yeah. get Joe Swinson and Nicholas but, Dodgen. But, try, try, try and put that on the telly. By the time you've got it out, they've, they've switched over to the wrestling. I'm sorry. But, but. <laughs> uh, there, there have been some very good headlines up here, mostly to do with football. But uh, yeah. can I just say, before we even open up the whole avenue that is uh, Brexit, can I just say thank you very much to our panel. That's been fantastic. Thanks for sharing your behind-the-scenes uh, insights. 
uh, your knowledge of the problem itself. Thanks, in fact, for the coverage you give. Uh, you're giving up precious time, which could be spent at the SNP conference or covering Brexit at Westminster. So I'm very conscious covering that you've given Brexit. up us today. Going off so to cover Brexit. Great. Okay. Listen, listen. You know, the pre the pre union Parliament banned golf and football. I mean, compared to what we what this Parliament gets up to, that's really something. Speaking as a 28 handicap hack golfer and a Dundee United fan, I think they were onto something. But I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's only a thought. Brian, thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, can I ask you to join me in thanking our panel uh, this afternoon and thank you too for coming along. Thank you. Thank you.